Good evening. My name is Waltraud Reiner. Um, I'm a psychotherapist in Milana living in Melbourne and I'm speaking to you from Melbourne, Australia. And I've got the great um, joy really today to introduce and listen and be part of Margarita Spaniola Lob and Greer White as they have a conversation around what it means to be a therapist. I will not give you a great introduction into their bios because this has been sent to you in your registration confirmation. And I would like to only say that I um, adore Margarita and also Gria. I have learned a great deal uh, from both of them as long I have known them, which is not such a great deal of time. And I'm very grateful to count those women to the shoulders I stand on as a budding therapist. I would like to tell you for those people who do not know that Gria is sitting in Italy in her home and sorry, um, <laughs> Margarita <laughs> is in Italy in her it's home. Exactly. <laughs> <It's laughs> and, <early. laughs> and Margarita uh, and Gria is in Brisbane, which is the east coast of Australia. So it's quite extraordinary, really, that we as people can uh, dialogue across the world at the same moment in time. As a bit of housekeeping, I just want to tell you that you will not be able to ask direct questions as this is a recorded webinar. The reason for that is that we do not want to cross your privacy issues and um, Margarita might most likely use this for educational purposes or put it on her website. So all questions you do have, please use the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. In, and any questions you have at any time, put them in. I will monitor them and put them to the two as we go on. The chat function on the right-hand side, I would like to ask you not to use because your name will show up if you do that, and that would mean it becomes public if this gets posted. So if you have no issue with that, then go ahead, use it. But I'm telling you that will mean you will be seen. The two of them will speak about the experience they have as a Gestalt therapist and trainers, how COVID impacted all of us. Uh, Margarita will have some thoughts about that, no doubt. They will focus on the importance of the practitioner and I am hopefully can um, contribute with relaying questions, the many questions you are going to tell me about. I welcome you all and especially Greer and Margarita who are already sitting here. Greer, Margarita, welcome. Thank you, Veltra. So Thank you. Here is the three of us, and I am wondering, as it's, this is a conversation and not a talk, we are, you haven't uh, sort of sat down and prepared a wonderful slideshow for us. It's really a, a demonstrating a conversation which a gestaltist can have outside of the room and inside of the room. What does it mean by the end of the day, we are dialoguing with clients and we are dialoguing with people, friends and family. And what does that look like? So maybe who wants to sort of kick off? Hmm. Well, okay. I just want to say it's lovely to be sitting with you, Margarita. Yes, the same for me. Yeah, such a long time. And a couple of um, people have, have messaged me here. So, I've so seen. I, so, I'm, yeah, I'm feeling seen and, and happy to be here. Yes, I, I'm reading people who are telling you something who have been your students. Students, yes, yes. Yes, yes um, I'm very happy to be here and have this conversation with you, Greer. Um, because the, the, the subject of being a Gestalt therapist, I think it's a very dear to both of us. Um, the way I saw you 
being a trainer and gestalt therapist and the way you take care of your students or you know your trainers and and your your clients it's very special and you are a very special person to me so yeah. i can imagine how uh, authenticity and spontaneity is important for you even yeah. in the in the training in the making of a gestalt therapist and how you struggle in your mind when you are a therapist you know or or a trainer how you struggle in your mind how to support this person to be more spontaneous to develop his or her own intentionality so this is what i can guess from your way of being and, and this is also what i believe yes uh, yes and i know you believe it from your writing and i know you believe it from the teaching that i've been part of and if it wasn't for COVID, i would have had more of that yes and yes yeah and yes. I, I suppose thinking about tonight and our conversation and what it takes to be a therapist what what happened for me i was kind of overwhelmed by the task for a new therapist they have to learn this method that we have and then somehow bring their own empathy and resonance to to the situation and i think that is incredibly complex Mm -hmm. It is. And um, I could start even before when they choose to, uh, to enter a psychotherapy, a gestalt therapy training, you know, because I do in my school, I, I, I interview all the students who, wants, who want to become gestalt therapists. And I ask them, why do you want to become a gestalt therapist and not a psychoanalyst or, or a behavior therapist or something like that? And what, what attracts them is, um, of course, the creativity, yeah. the possibility to be uh, oneself, to be um, not to betray themselves, you know, to believe in what they do. And also something special that they perceive between being a psychoanalyst and being a behavior therapist, which are the two opposite poles, you know, Yes. They perceive Gestalt therapy like a third possibility, which is to be in the present. So the phenomenology, to be in the present with the other, the phenomenology, the relational approach and the aesthetic approach. Yes. The aesthetic is also very attractive to them. So to use their senses and know the word, let's say, know the other, know the client, via their senses. Uh, so to use the body very much. Yes. Uh, I think this is something that attracts them when they, they want to become gestalt therapist and not something else. And I also like to add another thing that I always tell them, I don't think that gestalt therapy is the best approach. I don't think that. I think that any approach is very good, but the, if you choose to become a gestalt therapist, this means that you like it. Yes. And um, so I, I, I think it's an ethical point from us, gestalt therapists and trainers, not to say that we are the best, but we are one like others and, and we respect other approaches. Mm -hmm. And maybe when they are already gestalt therapists, they can dialogue with other approaches. I agree with that. I have always worried when, you know, our students say, oh, you know, I'm a gestaltist, like I've got something that's really special here. And it's like, no, we have to dialogue. We have to be with our brothers and sisters and other modalities. The thing that I found when I used to interview students was that they had met a gestalt therapist that had worked for them. And it was, it was really the relational aspect 
and someone who was deeply interested in them that worked and that they saw that they wanted. Yes, this is true also yeah. for me. Maybe I can say something here, being a butting therapist and I, if what was it for me? How did I, why did I choose Gestalt? I feel Gestalt chose me and it's very, uh, very refreshing to hear you say, Margarita, that it's not the be all and end all, that there is more to it, which makes me think of all the hats I am here surrounded by. There's so many different type of hats made from different foundations, but the end result is a hat which can be worn, but the structures are very, very different. And that doesn't make one structure, doesn't make it better than the other. And I didn't really know too much about Gestalt, to be honest. I didn't choose Gestalt. I just wanted to be a therapist. And it seemed like Gestalt, people said, that would suit you. It's creative. And I, I had sort of a diff, uh, already uh, a, a great love for 30 years for, for therapeutic endeavors. And Gestalt became the hat which seemed to fit the best. And I'm learning how to wear it. So it's, um, I think that's very interesting to hear yeah this i think to be to be humble uh, together with other brothers and sisters is very important because it helps us also to describe better what we are and what we are not and so to to deeply study uh, our epistemology and and to to describe things with our own language this is something we we are invited to do you know because uh we cannot speak of counter transfers we cannot speak of projective identification i mean we cannot we we can we have we can use another language for that it's a phenomenon that has been described by psychoanalysts already and so what is counter transfers for us i i i have answers about that, you know? I don't speak of counter transfer. I speak of aesthetic relational knowledge, which is more connected with uh, how the therapist feels, the being in a, in a relational field, the being in a phenomenological field with the client, resonating somehow with the situation. So this is a more phenomenological and aesthetic language to say, to describe the counter transfer. It's just an example. Yes. Um, Margarita, I, we, we've talked about the relational response for, for a, a few years now. It's been it's quite a long time. And I want to say that your work around the aesthetic and, and the role of the therapist really puts for me language around what it means to be relational and gestalt. And I know that in the past, without your language, I've talked about the self as instrument and, and how we, we touch what's in ourselves in order to be there for the other. But I just want to thank you for your language or, what that means, you've in depth that for me in a way that really makes sense now on how I do that more in depth way. Mm -hmm. so I thank you for that. There is thank a question you. which actually is asking if you guys could speak to the, and I think that might be a question for you, Margarita. Uh, can you speak to the dual development in the making of a therapist, the relationship of personal and professional development in your students? Mm -hmm. Yeah, as Greer was saying, uh, the relational aspect has become basic for us in the last years, and it is connected with the knowledge, with the uh, with the concept of field, 
we speak of phenomenological field, which means that any development, any, any learning is, emerges from a field. So when, and if we bring this to the student, you know, what this, the student experiences in the group uh, where the training happens or with the trainer is a basic thing for his or her development. So the um, relational aspect, which is also the field aspect, is a basic aspect to become a psychotherapist. And the, the question is, what the question is not so much what is the best uh, task, what is the best, uh, yes, accomplishment or aim, goal that this student has to achieve, but what is the best environment? What is the best field, not only environment, but also the field. So the dance that there is between the therapist and the, the, the trainer and the student, what is the best dance for this student? So we, we don't focus anymore just on the student who has to become in a certain way, you know, um, reach certain goals, but we focus on what happens between the trainer, the group, and the student. Uh, so what is the best dance for this student? Because if we focus on the dance, then we are speaking in terms of the best conditions, the best situation for that student to develop, to become a good therapist. And the good therapist means, I, I also like what you think about this, Greer, what, who is the best? Who is the good therapist, the good gestalt therapist? I think the good gestalt therapist is the therapist who can resonate uh, resonate freely, spontaneously with yes. the client and with the situation and can support the intentionality and the spontaneity of the of the student. Yes. Yes, I agree. For me, the best therapist is the one that can sit in front of the client or the group, student, and have a, a real sense of what's going on in, in, the, in the person and really gather that information. I, I have words for that. My words are, how does this person do life for me? So, and to be vitally interested in that. And I think that's the intentionality you talk about to have mm -hmm. such an interest in the other that it actually sparks something in me that, that is exciting. And yes. absolutely, what, what, is, what is it that, how this person does life, how, how they live their life. And when I see that interest in a student, it's like, oh yeah, this is going, she or he will be a good therapist. That's because, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, they're absolutely excited by the other person. That's it's wonderful. A wonderful. That's it's a lovely... A, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I, it reminds to me art, and you are an artist. Yes, beginning so, art. <laughs> so it's when the student becomes an artist somehow. Yes. And this, no. you know, reminds to us of what Peirce said, and also what Erwin Polster says about being interested in the other. Yes. That's a beautiful mm -hmm. segue into the question we have got here actually, which is asking about the word aesthetics. Well, that, can, I, uh, can I answer that one? Yeah. Because I, I've had to really um, make sense of that, Margarita. For aesthetics to me is, means beauty. So I've had to really go into your understanding of aesthetic and, and, and coming at it with the senses. And so I've done it. It's like, yes, of course, when we look for beauty, we come at it with our senses. We have to find the beauty with our senses. Yes. So, and when we are also the other way when we are present with our senses we can see the beauty that's right 
That's right. And and that's what I talk about when I talk about the excitement of how a person does life. Yes, exactly. Yes. Yeah. The beauty that I can see, the ascetic knowledge, and that's the ascetic knowledge, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. It is. And I consider two aspects of this. We are speaking of the presence of the therapist, right? Yes. We are speaking of the quality of the presence, which is an aesthetic quality, which means to be so present to their senses, to be alive, to get in touch with their own liveliness and to see their life, the aliveness of the other. Yes. The life in the other. Yes. So aesthetic means to see the beauty. And beauty means to see the life, the, the aliveness in the other that brings forward development and contact with the world. Yes, yes. I, I have a 16 year old student that I'm working with at the moment who is so depressed and down. And I saw his mother this morning and she said, he can't wait to come tomorrow. And I thought, oh, yeah, and that attaches me because his excitement about coming, I don't see yes. when he's sitting there, but it's, yeah. It's wonderful, yeah? Yeah, it's yeah. wonderful. It's wonderful for someone to be so... Yeah, like our founders said, that uh, the re resistances to contact or, you know, interruptions of contact are a way of, are vital ways to defend oneself. Yes. So if this guy, this adolescent that you are, your client, you know, mm. he's defending himself. He has his own right to defend himself. Yes, yes. And he's having a hard time at school and he's sick. So he has every right to be feeling mm. as he's feeling. Yes. So to recognize the beauty that is in his depression yeah. is what we do to support his vitality. And we don't want to change him. We don't want to change the behavior. We want to support what is vital in, in, in his problem. Yes. Yeah. And so beauty doesn't always have to look beautiful. That, and that's my point for mm -hmm. bringing him up. Sometimes it looks harsh and hard and painful. Yes. Um, and also, um, I think that beauty and the recognition of the beauty is always connected to a relationship. Yes. And when you look at the, at the work of art, the piece of art, you are attracted by something. And I look at the same piece of art and I'm attracted by something else. So we, there is not one way to recognize the beauty of the other. No, that's true. So every client will have a different story with a different therapist, yeah. but that doesn't mean that one is wrong and one is right. No, no, they are as they are. And we are as we are when yes. we meet them. And for me, that's the most valuable thing to teach. Mm -hmm. Yes. The, the therapeutic relation, relationship is a unique dance, a unique creation mm. Mm. in itself. It's a be beautiful in itself, you know? Yes, it is. Because when there is the, the ethical stance of a therapist who wants to be a therapist, I think the ethical stance uh, is important for it is, is one important thing for the therapist it's the only important thing because he has to become he has to stay as a therapist he has to stay in the relationship as, as a therapist which means to take care of the other and not to, not to be you know to use the other for his or her own purpose yes. so this is very important to me yes. this is something that doesn't change it's, it's the same for everybody but then inside this position ethical position when the therapist wants to help the client, uh, then an, a different, a new dance emerges, therapeutic dance emerges. Can you say more about the ethical stand of staying a therapist? Both of you, this question really, um, sort of some, some key elements, because I have seen at 
on different Gestalt posts and um, people saying I've been to a Gestalt um, therapist and and they they told me about their own problems and they told me they're disappointed with me and this is not what I'm going to a therapist for. Clearly overstepping ethical boundaries. Um, a sort of missing that fine the tuning of what the, the the relationality within staying in the ethics of the therapist yeah for me it's really important that i am there for the other as another and i meet them with myself but always with the understanding of being a therapist that i'm not their friend i suppose it's easier to define it what i'm not mm. i'm not their friend i don't cross that line but i really am wholeheartedly there for the person i i i, I sometimes i do put myself there. I, I find it much easier to work with people that show some interest in me. Because then the mutuality can build. I don't require a great deal of inf giving out information on me. But yeah, this is a relationship that I want to work for them. And for them to know their situation and to be able to explore what that means for them and how they can um, enhance their life. I, I feel like it, as a therapist, a person practices living well with me. Hmm. Yeah. Do you want to add? Yeah, I was many, many thoughts about this, you know, what it, uh, it starts from why do we choose to become therapists? What yeah. is our intentionality? Um, well, to, to appreciate the beauty in the other, to support the beauty in the other and in the world, I think this is a good motivation to become a psychotherapist. Um, and sometimes when we become psychotherapists, we have um, like a side uh, wishes to, to be important or to, uh, to be recognized. And of course, we go through all this in our personal therapy. I think that the ethical position has to do with the, with the work that the therapist does on him, him or herself very much. And nevertheless, the, the, it's always a difficult point, you know, how much we are doing this for the other as therapists or, or we, have, um, we, are, we, are, we are connected with some rigid principles. Um, so sometimes it's easy to understand that we do something when we are attracted by a client, for instance. You know? So what do we do? We try to understand that attraction in relational terms. So how come I'm attracted by this client? Um, how, what, what, what's the meaning in the life of the client that I'm the therapist I'm attracted by him or her? You know? so, so this is easy to understand because it's of course, when we are attracted by a client, we, we know that we don't have, we cannot go to this client and have a peer relationship. So this is easy to understand that we, we need to switch the, uh, the, the attraction into a caring relationship. And so uh, try to understand how come we feel attracted just by that client. What's the meaning in the client's life? But then there are other more difficult points about the ethical stance. Uh, for instance, I have, um, I have a psychotic client. She's, she's uh, not the chronic one. She's, uh, you know, I see her in individual set setting, not, not in a psychiatric context. So she's adjusted to society, but she's psychotic. And, and um, it was sometimes she needs um, medicine, medication. 
So it was difficult for me to convince her to take this medication, but she did it. But she always has this idea that uh, she's, not, uh, she's not completely well if she takes medication. And she's also afraid, paranoically, that uh, the, the medication will hurt her, would be dangerous to her health. So now she met uh, a group of Buddhist, Buddhist that, and she heard that the medication is not good for her. It dirties her channels, the, her energy channels. And so she took away her medication and she's, uh, uh, she's you know, crazy again. She's not, uh, she, she, her humor, her, um, you know, mood is unbalanced. What to do with this client? You know, because she also wants, she feels that she wants to be more autonomous. So I'm, I'm with her trying to support her wish to be autonomous and at the same time, uh, make her feel that I'm, I'm there for her and not to demonstrate that she has to take medication, not to demonstrate that she's crazy and she needs to take the medication for the whole life. And this is difficult for me as well because sometimes I'm afraid that she will, she will lose herself. I mean, so it's not so easy always to to yeah. follow the ethical stance, yeah. Wow. It's, um, that's very uh, interesting because there's ramifications with, with that, not just ethically, there's also legal replica, replica, um, problems one can have by holding that person as, as, a, as a psychotherapist here in Australia, I would be very scared about that um, if they, with not drugs, not, not having an understanding around drugs and, and what is necessary. And you're just speaking to a male client of mine. Um, and that's very scary. What, what to do with that? How, mm. how hand them on if they refuse to be in a team and knowing at the same time, you could mm -hmm. hold them, but I'm not God. Yeah, there, there's a question. If I share with this client the, my fear, uh, yes, in this case, I did share with her that uh, I was afraid, I am afraid that she can lose herself. And after all the efforts that she has done and we had done together for her to, to be um, more rational in her work to 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 reach some you know achievement in her work. She's very creative. She's a beautiful person. So I was afraid of all this. I told her, and uh, but still, she she has this dream, or I don't know, maybe she has this right. I would say that she wants to to live by herself. She doesn't want to be dependent on medications. And I respect that. I decided to respect that, to, to, to see the, you know, the vital aspects in this. But I'm not going to leave her. I'm not going to. I'm there checking how she is every day. And, uh, you know, uh, I, 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 she knows that my idea is that it's better to take medications. You check every day. Yeah, with uh, text messages, she needs it. Wow. She needs and it, yeah. It's important for you to express your fear to her, but then not to hound her with yeah, your Yes, it, yeah, so it's like, uh, you know, this is my maybe my limitation, but yeah. I have to tell you that because yeah. this is my discomfort. Mm. Mm. But then to deal with your own fear without giving it to her every time you see her. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. It's always a balance. How much to contain her, how much to uh, give her, you know, the support her in her freedom and how much to contain her. That's right. Mm. That's good. So can you speak some more to the experience? How does the experience differ as a trainer to the students and as, I mean, you, you sort of said quite a bit around 
being the therapist in the room with a client, how do you feel you both are different as if you are different as therapist versus trainer? Hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know how different I am. <laughs> <laughs> And then outside of the room, of both rooms, in the world. Well, how, how am I as a person in my ordinary life? Well, that's different again. Mm. But, but as a trainer and as a therapist, mm. I'd like to think I'm congruent mm -hmm. in the way I approach students and the way I approach my clients. I think it's difficult with teaching because there's that, that crossover of giving information and then assessing information. There's, there's some judgment there on the person that can be really difficult when it comes to training. But I try to be really open and around that and identify that that is difficult. But that's, that would be the same as saying I'm scared. I think you'd be better off using drugs. It's, it's having the real conversations. Mm -hmm. And when I'm, and I like to think that that when I leave the training room and I'm just having a cup of tea, that I'm still congruent. Yes. Uh, did you finish? Yeah, that's enough. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I agree with you. I like the word congruent. And uh, I, I, I think uh, the word ethical position is parallel to this. Yeah. So uh, I think when we, when we are trainers, we support our students in going again, again, and again on the same or similar topics. Uh, and we teach them to stay in the situation, to stay in a situation with clear boundaries and, and a clear ethical position uh, that uh, is, is like uh, you know, learning how to be present in the therapeutic situation. Um, so they, they, I think we teach them two things. One, basically, you know, ideally, is that one is that they have to be clear in, this, in their position. And that means that they have to put themselves the right questions. To do therapy somehow is like to do research. Uh, so we, when we do research, we wonder, uh, what, is the, what is the question here? What is the research question? What is my position? What do I want to know? And so when we are with a client, we, we wonder, who, what is my position with this client? What am I doing with this client? It's like a research question. And the second thing is that the answer is not always, is, is not always possible in our isolation. So the answer is supported by a group. For a therapist, I think it's very important to belong to a group where to have supervision or intervision. So it's not even, even when the therapist is already uh, graduated, he's a therapist, but to be alone is very terrible. I think that to have supervision or intervision, to have a, a group of reference is basic to to learn every day a new thing. Yeah, I agree. I think it's really difficult to be alone as a therapist. And I see people who come for supervision who are in that alone space. And for their supervision, it is so important for them to be seen and to be and to talk about how they're engaging in their work and what's that like yeah. for them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, a concept that for me is important is that we, we need to overcome 
the, pers the narcissistic perspective for yeah. a psychotherapist. Because yeah. narcissistic perspective uh, brings isolation and the idea that they have to be perfect, they have to be the best one, they have to be very uh, well trained and they know what to do. No? But uh, this is not good for, uh, for Gestalt therapy also. To be Gestalt therapist, on the other, and on the contrary, we need to stay with the situation and with the limitations of the situation. So we don't have to be the best one. We don't have to know what is needed in that moment. We have to orient ourselves in, again, in a dance. Um, and what is important is not what we do, but also what the other answers to what we do. So it's not just what we do, but it's also what the other does. And so we need to adjust and see how the other adjusts to us. Yes. So again, it's the concept of dance or reciprocity for me is basic about being and remaining a Gestalt therapist and maintaining oneself as a Gestalt therapist. Hmm. I was wondering if um, we can get a little snapshot of people who we who actually we have got here because I've got a little poll. It's an anonymous poll. Uh, it's only a couple of questions um, to tell us uh, how long people have been a therapist and who we actually have in the audience and mm -hmm. what made them to today to join us in the talk. So if you guys could maybe answer that little uh, poll, that would be great. We won't see who is answering and uh, to give us a bit of an idea. Um, I just leave that up here for a second and we should have the results coming in. Um, we're so not, far. We're not finished, are we? No, no, no. This is just in between to give us an idea. You know, it might help you who we are sort of speaking to, and uh, and what the the expectations are. I mean, there's almost 75, 82 percent love Gria and Margareta. This is why they are here. Um, you you both can see the um, you can see it, Margareta and Gria. Yes, okay. the poll. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. So I um, was smiling. It's it's nice. Yeah. So uh, there's about forty seven percent newly graduated, nine nineteen percent students, twenty five more than five years, thirteen percent more than ten years, and a variety of reasons. Mainly great respect and love, I think, for the two of you. <laughs> they don't love me. <laughs> And uh, love for learning and curiosity wow. is is wonderful. Uh, Six sixty five percent, and uh, um, the money was for most of them not important. And uh, professional development points um, ranks also by the looks of it at third place. And um, the there's also something for you. I don't know you, Waltraud, but now I love you. <laughs> well, I love you guys that you all came and that this is possible. I love the technology and all of it. But that sort of give, gives us a bit of an idea that there's, you know, uh, um, because I think it's not just about the new therapist. It's also what, what does it take for a therapist when they have been in business for more than 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, how would the advice or your thoughts differ? And what is to be looked out for? I like, I like what Marguerite, you just said in when you in the last conversation, learn something new every day. Like mm -hmm. be involved yes. in, in the process of thinking about mm -hmm. your therapy and what you're doing and yes and and what is happening in our just field that can actually inform us yeah um also 
I think there is a question about the therapist burnout. And I was also thinking that we didn't approach at all this, the actual situation of the pandemic and how this impacts the, the well being of a therapist, not only the client, of course, but we are working, at least here in Europe, we are working so much, you know, much more than before. So maybe you could say something about that also. Yes, I think both questions speak to that. One speaks to the burnout and one speaks to the working on Zoom and the difference between face to face. What, um, how did you experience it? Because I think the world of therapy was thrown into the online. Uh, the mm -hmm. ones who were strictly against it were dragged in and the ones who kind of were open to it. And how is the experience? I like your analysis, Marguerite, of the change that's happened in our world and, and the needs of our clients and how that's changed because of COVID, terrorism. Do you, do you want to, I don't want to talk your words. Do you want to just talk yes. a bit about that? Yes, I can. And, uh, and I can also send the article you are referring to, I think, yeah. because it's a, it's a free access article in an APA journal, so it can be spread as we want. Uh, what I say is that um, uh, the pandemic ar arrived in an already fragile si social situation when the, the ground experience of everybody was already fragile, you know, like we were not sure of, of our ground, of how much our ground could be solid and uh, how much we could be sure and safe in, in uh, standing on our own feet. Um, I don't know how much this can be different from Australia or Europe or America, but I think that more or less there is a... Uh, a worldwide tendency. And when the pandemic came, of course, it, it is, it was and it is a collective trauma where the basic uh, conditions of our ground um, were perceived as dangerous, like the air that we breathe and the hugging, the physical closeness to those we love. They are both basic conditions for our well-being, for our growth and our feeling safe. So this has brought, of course, a very difficult situation. People are scared. They don't know what to do. And this has uh, um, touched us as well, because we are also people belonging to this world. So before knowing what to do with our client, I think we need to know how to, how to feel better ourselves. And since the pandemic you know, started one year and more than one year, I have supported a lot of dialogue among therapists because I think that dialogue is something that supports our ground experience, who we are and how we can mirror ourselves in, in the others. Um, associations and uh, you know peer groups are so important for us therapists in this moment because we need to know every day how to orient ourselves with our clients it's so difficult we ex we share the same experience as our client um, and uh, and and then with our client i think we need to to switch our focus from the figure to the ground. Uh, like before we were more focused on the meaning of something for our client. For instance, if the client says, uh, I cannot sleep well. And uh, we, we try to understand uh, how come this client could not sleep well. Like for instance, what do you feel when you go to sleep? How is your day? So we try to understand the the, the conflicts of this person. Now we, we need to address to the basic condition, to the ground experience of this client, like how does he or she breathes? How does she or he perceives the safety in his environment? 
um, in this sense, the, all, the, all the theories neuro, neurosci of neuroscientists like Borges or other neuroscientists are helping us a lot, telling us how much a person needs a sure, sure feeling, first of all, what is called the neuroception. Yeah? We need to feel sure in, an, in a situation, like we need to know that we can breathe, we can... We can uh, Look around. We can. We can. We are free to move. You know, to touch people who are important for us. And when we can do this, we cannot do this. Uh, it's very difficult to feel safe. So we need to build with our client the feel, the feeling of safety, the basic safety. And instead of asking the client, "What do you think before going to sleep?" we can ask, "Tell me, breathe." look at me and tell me I cannot sleep and tell me what you feel when you look at me, how do you perceive me? What do you feel when you look at me and you say I cannot sleep? So in this uh, meeting at the contact boundary uh, with the, the, the urgent need of the client, we can realize, we can co-create the sure ground that the client needs because we also are impacted by what the client tells us. He cannot sleep. What do we feel? Mm. Do we feel the same? Do we also can, cannot, can, maybe cannot sleep as well? Or we, have, we know people who cannot sleep. So we make a lot of associations and we feel something to this client, which is participating in his or her difficulty. And it is from this sharing the human quality of his suffering that we can build the being together and so the safe ground. This is what I say in this article, basically. Yes, it's a good article. Mm. And, and we do that now so often via Zoom. So that, I just want to answer that question that's up there, just to talk yeah. a little bit about how to do it. I, I find that my determination, my interest in the client has to be really focused when I work on Zoom. I have a tendency to want to be distracted. So for me, I have to really make sure that I'm active in building my interest in, in my client where when I'm sitting, it's like there's something happens, it's quite automatic. And I see the whole person and I can be, it, it doesn't require as much work for me. But when I'm over Zoom, I have to really make sure that I'm yeah. working, that I'm not just sitting there listening. Yeah. And we, we have so little, We've only got a head and maybe shoulders. So, yeah, uh, yeah. what's your experience, Margarita, in working? Yeah, I, you know, listening at you, I, I realized that um, I would say that we need to readjust to this situation, finding our, our own way of being a style therapist. You know, there, there has been many words have been said about. Uh, working on Zoom or, but what you are saying, uh, I think it's very, very new and, um, and interesting, alive. Like, um, I, I could say, if I imagine you, if I can be a little bit personal, uh, I'd, uh, I'd, I wonder how can, I, I imagine that your, your effort was, how can I be an ocean with this client on Zoom? Because I, I experience you like being able to be an ocean, you know, or like the, 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 you know, the strength of the ocean, the warm strength of the ocean. And so I imagine that your question was, how can I be an ocean via Zoom? Yes. Yes. Well, that, that makes sense because I don't just want to be a drip <laughs> 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 or a trickle. Yeah, I, I want to be there. 
Oh, yeah, with with your qualities, with your yes, pre that's presence. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I want to see the other. I'm wondering. You speak, but you speak to that you only are head and shoulders, or that you are and and the other person is as well. And I'm wondering, does the background become also something else, which usually we wouldn't have in the therapy room? On not necessarily us as a therapist, we still are in our therapy room with the same space what we choose to set up but we are going into the space of a client which is very unique and which usually doesn't happen would that sort of yeah. uh, uh, them in their situation yes of course of course and and i can also be distracted by the person like if I look at Margarita, I could spend all my time looking at the painting behind her, which which means mm. that I wouldn't be fully with her unless I engaged with her with the painting. Yeah. It's much more stressing for me to work on Zoom because uh, I need to be more uh, focused on this little screen and I cannot move my body. I mean, when we move our body, when we are in presence, we move our bodies much more, you know, we feel freer. And when we work on Zoom, it's um, more stressing, you know, because we need to focus everything in a little space. And yeah. You're right about moving the body. I hadn't thought about that, but yes, I'm quite, I move quite a lot when I'm sitting in my room opposite someone yeah. it makes me think i better move yes, my body. like this <laughs> or even look around with your hands you know we yeah. just like this mm. developing uh <laughs> how do you call it pain in your neck mm. <laughs> as long as we are not a pain in the neck <laughs> would you yeah. like to address the next question around supervision or would you like to say more about the zoom work um, There's I think a... I've said that. Mm -hmm. no. There's a question um, on um, therapists and receiving supervision when they are beginning therapists. Frequency, how often should they do it? And, um, and is more than one supervisor supportive? I think, it, well, first of all, it depends on the person and their needs. I absolutely love seeing beginning therapists for supervision. There's something really dynamic in their questions and their inquiries and, and to bring the inquiries. For me, that that's makes supervision really vital for beginning therapists. Yeah, I think that supervision is a basic tool for a therapist. So when, um, usually when we are, when students are under training program, they receive supervision in the training program. When they are graduated, they need to continue with supervision in the way they want, but it's, it's very important. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. for, for the reasons that we have said before, For their own vitality, their own support. And do you think it gets in the way to have two or three supervisors? That is part of the question, I think. Oh. And and how often? Weekly, fortnightly? I have a practice of monthly supervision with one supervisor. And that suits me very well. But being able then to talk about my practice with other practitioners. I, I like the relationship. I like building the, the relationship with my supervisor so that I know 
and trust her. So I wouldn't want to spread it around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, there's not something fixed, a, a fixed rule about supervision. But the, the, the main thing is that supervision is important, not to be isolated and to have a group of reference for, you know, to where, 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 where to feel that the others can have the same experience and where to build together new, new, new things, new answers to the questions, to daily questions, you know. But then everybody can choose the, the time of supervision, the, the, the kind of supervision. About having two or three uh, supervision settings, I don't know. Uh, um, I don't know. I'm, I would, I'm curious about, uh, about what kind of supervision they would be, uh, how they could be different, and, but... Uh, and they could be. You might, yeah, they could be. You might get something from one supervisor that you don't get from another. But I think what's important is that you have a good relationship and a trusting relationship. And often yeah. that happens over time. Yes. Um, um, I would think that uh, um, I have reflected about uh, gestalt therapy supervision. This is important to me, not to how many times to have it or well, what kind of supervision is important for a gestalt therapist. And I think that uh, um, the word recognition is important to, do, to, to receive supervision. To receive supervision means to be recognized, not to be uh, taught yeah. about what is, what is right and what is wrong. I think this is important for a Gestalt therapist, you know, that uh, wh when we are therapists, then we, we are trained to support the client, to recognize the client. But when we are supervisor, then we forget this. And we tell our supervisee what is wrong and what is what is right. I've seen this around, and I think it's not uh, it's not nice, you know. It's not fair for as, as a as a Gestalt supervisor, Gestalt therapy supervisor. I think we need to do the same thing with the supervisee. Uh, recognize their intentionality uh, for being a good therapist with that client and support their intentionality. I agree. And I love the word recognition, mm. to be recognized mm. as a therapist mm -hmm. and as a therapist that's learning and excited about exploring practice. Mm. That's the main thing for me around supervision. Mm -hmm. And yes. what, about, what about supervision if you have no clients, but you obviously have graduated? Yes, uh, if it's about a group, in a group, then you can listen to the others and continue to learn. If it's an individual supervision, I don't understand. I wouldn't understand that. You know? mm -hmm. it's more therapy. More therapy, yeah. Yeah. I'm... I'm kind of jumping between the chats and the Q&A. More people are using the chat than the Q&A. Um, and further up, we had around if you could speak both to burnout and how to support oneself, regardless where we are at in as a therapist of looking after ourselves. Margarita, I remember when you said that going to the pictures, going for picnics, having your massage <laughs> is all part of what it costs you to be a therapist. And our charge has to reflect that. That yes. we, we have to really make sure that we are looking after the fullness of who we are in order 
to avoid burnout. And we have to know what's, what's enough. I know that I, I, get, um, I can get quite stressed if I have too many clients in a day. If I come home with five clients and I'm eating too much, I know that something's wrong. Yeah. So I have to know myself. I have to consciously go about looking after myself. Yes. And manage the number of clients I have. For me, that's what's more important than anything at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, that's a bit off topic, Margarita. But your dog is <laughs> enticing my dogs. They are talking, they're hearing yours, and they are going, who is that new dog? So, is it disturbing? No, not at all. I'm just sharing oh, with you. <laughs> There's a conversation. There's a conversation going between on dogs. between the dogs. We don't quite understand, but they are. Yours says uh, something. Mine is talking back. <laughs> okay. yeah, I agree. Fun. I, I agree, Greer, that uh, we need to limit to recognize when we are uh, burnt out and so to limit our work and keep, keep vital. You know? Don't forget our, our, our child, our vital, our capacity to have fun. Yes. This is basic. You know? I, I, I remember very well when you brought me to the to see the kangaroos yes. in melbourne because i i wanted to see the kangaroos there it's so funny to me <laughs> and you understood that perfectly yes absolutely <laughs> it's a beautiful day it was a beautiful day yeah so we need to to stay tuned with our vitality and as my Tai Chi teacher says, smile, <laughs> smile <laughs> as you're doing it. <laughs> Makes a difference. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we really have to know that we, we are in being at the service of another are in danger ourselves unless we really take care of ourselves and yeah, we, fundamental mm -hmm. yeah maybe we, we can, i can expand, expand a bit on that is if we think that we 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 have to give much to that person who is in 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 uh, who is suffering no then we are in danger I, I, well, if we if we trust that the person who is suffering has his or her own vitality and self support, then we can protect ourselves as well. Yes, it, it's again it's an ethical stance. I think you know who we are in front of this person. Mm And knowing our limits and also knowing our compulsions, the compulsion to help sometimes can trip me up. Hmm. Hmm. It's very difficult to accept that we cannot help everything. That's right. Just for a time check, we have got 20 minutes and I would like to encourage our viewers to throw questions out. They find um, burning um, energy for, or if there's some around it, they would like to have answered that you don't miss out. And we, in the last five minutes, decide I would like to ask that. So just a bit of a heads up. Um, yeah, I, I think that many of us have been in burnout in this pandemic times because we have we we knew we felt that people 
are aware or are in need of being listened, of you know, spending more time with someone who can listen. So we know this, we can feel this. And we have, uh, uh, you know, offered ourselves mm -hmm. to this need, which is extraordinary uh, moment in, um, yeah, and we, it's difficult to limit, uh, to, to, to say at a certain point that we, ha we have limitations. We cannot do more than we do. It's hard to limit at times when you have someone that really is in need and suffering. And, and I know I can stretch myself and there's a point where I know stretching any further will really do me harm. And I, I think I, as I get older, I get a bit wiser on that. And being part-time, being semi-retired is a delight because they say I only work two days a week on my private practice. And then I have time. I have so much time to do what I need to do, which I haven't ever had time to do before. I can go walking and I can go swimming. I can do that physical stuff that my demands never let me do. And I know I'm a better therapist as a result. I know I'm more interested in my practice as a result, more interested in my clients. So yeah, it's a delight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you share this, Margarita? Margarita, um, I know. <laughs> oh, I, I, I was saying I'm, I'm a, in a position. I change it. What did I change in myself you know, in the pandemic? I, I, I did more meetings, more, more groups, more meetings with any kind of, with my own group. In my institute, we are about 80 trainers and 80 trainers, just trainers. So I had a lot of meetings with my trainers to support them to continue to teach to, the, to our students. It was a very difficult moment. And probably in Europe or in Italy, especially in Italy, we, it was worse than in, you know, in Australia. Yes, it because you, you're not so so in, you're not set in such a bad state in Australia. You are free from from COVID, and we 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 have the very very scaring, and we are still with high, high numbers of contagion. You know? So I, I did this. I did a lot of uh, le less clients and more meetings with uh, my uh, trainers and students. And, the, and then a lot of uh, Zoom meetings with um, colleagues from Europe who suffer not only from COVID, but also from political situations like um, Ukraine or Belarus. Uh, they are, I, I don't know how they can stand all this, you know, they are really suffering a lot because they have a difficult political situation and they are not protected by the state for the COVID, from the COVID. So they really needed some, just some, be listened, you know, ju just some help in doing groups. And, and I did a lot of conferences, online conferences to support uh, psychotherapists and gestalt therapists in this moment. Um, and I organized a lot of dialogues myself and I wrote a lot. Yes. So, yes, I published two uh, issues, a special issue in the APA journal about uh, being gestalt therapist in time of COVID, and then a special issue in the International Journal of Psychotherapy about um, gestalt therapy, relational development and research. These are two uh, free, um, you know, section, special section. I can send, I can send them to, to you, Valtro, then you can spread Yes. Okay. Yep. I'll do that. 
there's actually a, a question which speaks to the uh, there's, that there seems to be different schools and approaches within the Gestalt psychotherapy. How can we negotiate possible differences or views? Any hints on that? Um, uh, I can answer about the situation from the States and Europe, you know. Uh, I'm maybe I'm, I'm also curious about Australia how what kind of currents you have so I can answer about Europe and uh, Italy Europe and how we have been influenced by the states and by South America um, here the, the Latin Latin speaking Latin language uh, countries they have been influenced more by the South American gestalt therapy or let's say the gestalt therapy that was developed after Ezalen and Peirce uh, death, and which means also um, Claudio Naranco and uh, the South American trainers. And this influenced, um, besides psych uh, South America, um, Spain and Italy as well. Mm -hmm. And then there is the current that comes from the no North America, uh, which is from New York and from Cleveland. From, from Cleveland, uh, like the pollsters, the nevises and uh, uh, Zinker, they have been influenced, um, you know, uh, English speak speakers have been influenced by that. And then Laura Peirce and Isidor Fromm, it's, Isidor Fromm was my therapist. So I've been influenced by New York, the New York Institute, and they have, uh, influenced um, the Netherlands and uh, France and part of Italy, my institute, etc. So there have been three currents, let's say, but now they are merging, uh, especially uh, the European Association for Gestalt Therapy, the EAGT, has created a lot, a lot of meetings to dialogue together and find new developments. So now the, um, especially in Europe, there is um, the relational current, so-called, which is very much spread. And it, it is uh, developing something that was already in our roots in the, in the basic book of Per Sefferlein and Goodman, that is the concept of field, organism, environment field, and how this changes our focus. So as I said before, we don't work on the individual, but we work on the situation on what happens between therapist and client and what I call the dance, you know, the reciprocity. This is very new, very, you know, the, the, the relational development, uh, relatively new. It's around the nineties, this, uh, this uh, current um, started to develop. And there are a few, um, you know, so the, this, you can find this in certain uh, trainers and less in other trainers, but I think there's a trend to develop the relational aspects altogether. How is in Australia, Bria? Yeah, I, I think Australia, we've always known we're so far away and we've always relied on the development from overseas. So I know for myself and for Gestalt Therapy Brisbane, which is the institute I was with, we've always gone looking for what is the new theory? What is the development that's happening? So yeah, we embraced the relational a number of years ago. Probably we're least influenced by South America. Mm, yes. You know, but definitely influenced highly by North America and in the last 10 years by Europe. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I feel like it's, it's a lot of um, new developments and a lot of new ways of looking at it that we have to explore. It's new knowledge that may or may not influence our work. Yeah, I don't, I don't see that there's a clash or a different style, maybe different emphases at times. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. there was a rupture inside the Gestalt therapy itself at the beginning when Paris went to left New York and went to to Esalen. There, there was a rupture in the in the history. You know? um, but I think you all know this. Yes. And Australian, we, we never really rely on ourselves for new knowledge. We have to go further afield, and we do, yeah. Yeah, you are a new baby. Yes. <laughs> yes. So where is Gestalt and Gestalt therapist headed? Um, in, in on a global sense. Any thoughts on that as we are nearing the end? Hmm. When you, you say the Gestalt and Gestalt therapy, I think this is already important. Uh, Isidore Fromm, my therapist, used to say, used to insist on calling it Gestalt therapy. It's not Gestalt, it's Gestalt therapy. Um, this, this is important to give dignity to our approach, which is not just a philosophy. Uh, it's not just a way of being, but it is also a way of being, but it is a, 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 um, a therapeutic approach with its own theory, its own methodology, practice, and theory of psychopathology and uh, development, theory of development. So it's a very interesting uh, approach, which is a third force, you know, between, as I said, psychoanalysis and, and behavior therapies. It's the phenomenological approach. It's very interesting, very, very, very alive, you know, and very different. Um, and so we need to call it Gestalt therapy uh, to give dignity to, to, to this. And uh, the, I think the future is to develop more and more this quality that we have said today, you know, the, the, to support the vitality. And, and so the vitality means also the phenomenological intentionality of, that is always in the relationship. And to, to use our aesthetic tools to do this. So to use our aesthetic tools means to use our presence in artistic terms, in aesthetic terms, like Rear said very well at the beginning, we are, we are there, our presence is important because the more we are alive, the more we can discover the beauty in our client and in the people we take care of. So I think the future is to develop this the aesthetic, the phenomenological aesthetic and relational approach in this specific field field-oriented aspect. And our future lies in our skills and being able to do that. Otherwise, we will just merge and become another modality. So our, our vitality as therapists will mean there will be vitality in Gestalt therapy in the world. Right, very, very well said. Mm. I am thinking of something you said, Margareta, a while back, and you said something along that Gestalt therapists have a, uh, an opportunity and almost responsibility to step outside the therapy room and be active in the world as Gestaltists. Can you say something? I know it might be a bit big, but say something to that. Yeah, this is important. We didn't approach this, but it's no. very important. Yeah. We are, we are in our blood. We are social activists. We never, we don't believe that, uh, the, you know, this, the, uh, to cure a client is, is it. But we have always a critical political mind and we believe that what we do with the client is part of the of a social activism, is part of our intervention on the in the world. 
So there are many, many Gestalt therapists who are social activists, and I, I like that very much. I think it's wonderful because it's it's our our soul. Um, we need to have a critical mind on society and support uh, a well-being of society without becoming, of course, uh, you know, paranoid. But uh, uh, if we can do something, we need to stand up and say something. Um, this has always been like this in our history as Gestalt therapists. The founders were social activists. And in the New York Institute, it's still something very important to be social activists. Yeah, um, I think uh, when our students come to us and say, what do you think of this injustice that I experienced in, a in my job, for instance? Yeah? Uh, we cannot say, okay, this is another thing. Let's say, well, here, this is that thing. No? When, when there is an injustice in some place, we need to reflect about it. We need to know what we can do with, in a humble way, with our limitations, what we can do to support the, the, the situation. Hmm. I agree. Hmm. We are of the situation. And like Wallens has done lovely work in that, hasn't he? Like I love yes. his work. George's uh, Wallens. Yes, that the pathology doesn't lie in the person, it lies in the situation. Right, right. Beautiful work. Yes, I, I, had, I had that book in mind for the old time, Greer, also because I'm translating it into Italian. Are you? So, yes, wow. but I had that book in mind the old time, and now you say it. Yes. Yeah. Well, yes, yes. He's, he's gifted us with something in that text. Yes. And, and if we believe that, we, we have to somehow move the situation, not just try to repair our clients. Well, that brings us beautifully to almost a closure. And I would like to put a question to both of you. Is there anything you think you would like to add regardless whatever it is which you would like to say before we call this a night and for you a day, Margarita. <laughs> well, um, I thank you, Waltraud, for having organized this. And I thank all the, um, all the people who, unfortunately, I could not see, but uh, I, I know they, you are there. And you have been, you have participated. So I'm sorry that I could not meet in with our seeing each other, but uh, I, I felt your presence. And I especially thank you, Greer. It has been such a pleasure to to be together in this short time mm -hmm. and to to renovate, you know, our our vital dance. Yes. And thank you, Margarita. It's always lovely to spend time with you. And I long for the time when I can fly there, across the ocean. I remember when we said goodbye in, in Northern Rivers, and we said it's only an ocean between us, and that ocean just seems to have got wider with COVID. So I look forward to being there mm -hmm. next year. And I too appreciate the knowing that people were there and seeing your comments and questions. So thank you. And Veltra, thank you. Thank you for organizing it. I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> so that's, a, that. that's a great pleasure. Thank you. And also people who have been here will not be anonymous because Margarita and Greer We'll have a list of your names, so they very much will recognize, no doubt. And if not, you you are not just an, a, a person in no man's land there. You're very much held by name in our awareness. So thank you for supporting this. And I have learned a great deal, and it's just wonderful again 
to climb down from for tonight off your shoulders. Thank you for letting me stand on them. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. Thank you. Good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.